Hello and welcome to Bastionland Broadcasting, where tonight we are going back to Mythic Bast... I, I still can't... I, I can't work out which way I need to point on this screen because it's because <laughs> it's not mirrored. What was that, th th 20 seconds before I made the first mistake? Yeah, we're going back to Mythic Bastionland here. Um, last week, if you were here, we spoke a little bit about uh, the the preparation that a referee would do before running this game and um we kind of touched on the kind of overall theme of what this game is about um today as promised we are looking at the player side of things and we're going to jump straight in what's the first thing we need to think about when we're thinking about the player side of things it is of course characters and we've got our character sheet here so um this character sheet is freely available. It's linked at the back of the um, at the game back of the game document, um, and yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna roll some characters because something I've always tried to do since um, since Into the Odd really is my ideal um, version of character creation. I, I do like some randomness in there. I like, in fact, I like a lot of random randomness in there, um, but I like. The idea that a player could sit down to play a game and know basically nothing about it but sit down and generate a character and that tells them enough to kind of get started with what the game is about so we'll do a little dummy run of that today uh, so this is our character sheet let's get to the actual uh, thing okay so um, here we go let's in fact let's zoom in a little bit To help with our eyesight. Um, so, you are a knight. In fact, you are knights um, united by a common oath and visions of the city. Um, you're going to be travelling together as a company, which has been deemed by the seers. Uh, you may rest, roam, or depart for good, but your collective journey will be as one. Um, roll d12 plus d6 for each ability score in order, and they are vigour, wit, and grace. Um, I'm fighting real hard to not like go into like <laughs> the rationale behind a load of this stuff, but we're just gonna we're just gonna get on with it. So D6 and D12, it's a slightly strange combination, but as you'll see, you end up with similar numbers to what you get with 3D6, but you get a slightly different distribution. You actually get a slightly wider distribution. It doesn't quite funnel the results to the middle quite as much. So you do hopefully end up with a slightly wider spread of scores. Now I've jinxed it by saying that because straight away we roll 11. In fact, <laughs> thank you, um, Woogie Nut, for pointing out that was a D10, not a D12. So we'll, we'll roll that again. That was a nice dummy run. Six, well, I guess that serves me right for not paying attention. So Vigor six, um, as you probably know, if you're rolling D12 and a D6 together, the average is 10. Minimum is two, maximum is 18. 13 in wit, so we can rely on our, our wits a little bit. And grace, 11. So that's kind of unremarkable. So we've got a character who perhaps lacks a little bit of physical vigor, but they have more sort of wit to make up for it. So they are going to perhaps rely on their quick thinking. Um, guard is this game's version of HP, if if you remember how HP works in Into the Odd and Electric Bastion Land. Um, because Into the Odd and Electric Bastion and uses this system where you don't roll to hit, you just immediately start losing HP. Um, originally, it was just called Hit Points in Into the Odd, and then I soon changed it to Hit Protection because that made a bit more sense. But I thought for this game, let's give it an actual... Because I've sort of clung to the HP um, legacy, I guess. Um, but I thought for this game, let's try shaking it off and let's try calling it something different that perhaps more accurately reflects what it is. So we've got guard, um, and you're going to get d6 points of guard. Two points of guard is, is not fantastic. And we're going to start with we're going to start with no glory. Um, in fact, let's let's explain why we start with no glory. So, uh, at the end of each season or age, knights will gain glory if they fulfill their oath. If they do, they'll ascend the ranks. So glory is kind of I hesitate to say it's like XP because it's kind of not, um, but it's it's something that you keep track of and it gives you kind of 
it doesn't you don't grow more powerful as you gain glory but it will give it does have a kind of in-world um, benefit as you can see here as you go up through the ranks of glory you become worthy of other things in the eyes of other knights and other powerful people in the world we'll come back to this at the end because we're, we're going to do a little bit of a run through so we'll come back to the glory and how you get it um so we've rolled our ability scores we need to know who we are so we're going to go to our knights and the intent is that there will be 72 of these as of today there are 24 in the playtest document and i'm now going to stop just giving them away <laughs> and including them in the in future playtest so all these ones will be getting written up in the background, but these 24 are done. Um, so let's see who we get. We're going to treat, because we only, we need, you, normally again you would roll a d6 and a d12, but for the d6, if it's odd we're going to say it's 1, if it's even we're going to say it's 2, because they're the only ones we have. So, so that will count as a 1 and a 10. So we find the knight that exists in... 1 and 10, which is the Riddle Knight. So let's find the Riddle Knight. The right words say everything and nothing, a different truth to each ear. Now I'm going to do the standard disclaimer of saying that the art that's in this is just placeholder art from Mid Journey. Um, the intent, in fact, I, I'm. It, it's not just my intent, it is going to have um, artwork by an actual person. And um, hopefully that's something I can talk about soon um but yeah the, the the plan is to have actual human artwork in here this is this is just placeholder really for the for the purposes of the play test so the knight gives us some property so we have a twisted bow uh which is a does d6 damage and is a long weapon let's put that in so property twisted oh we're not going to be needing quite that much so we have a twisted bow uh, we have light armor in fact we'll call it hooded armor because it said light armor with hood um, moon pendant and that's going to grant the wearer a false form each night and each night we'll roll on here to see what happens so let's say hypothetically that Knight fell on this character. We'd roll 2d6. 6 and 6 would mean that our form for that Knight would be a regal feline form. And then the next Knight we would go under a different form. So this is kind of like the class. well, I say classic. It's, it's kind of like a, it's a reference to a few things, but like the, the Knight that has an alternative form in under certain conditions. So getting changed into an animal. Uh, and we have a shadowy horse. Um, who's, who's very quiet and has some stats of their own. And we have a feat. Now, every knight can perform three feats. And this is one of the big differences from Electric Bastion Land. Um, in Electric Bastion Land, the characters were kind of like, and into the yard actually, the characters were kind of just like desperate losers that became treasure hunters. But in this game, even though you're starting out as like petty knights, you, I wanted them to start with something that made them feel a little bit more heroic. Not on the full on like D&D, &D, like superhero, um, like fourth edition, you know, high level D&D &D thing. I, I didn't particularly want that. But I just wanted them to have a few little tricks up their sleeve that show that they were like martially competent, I guess, and a little bit more survivable. So you have these three knightly feats that they can perform. Um, they can smite someone for extra damage, but they'll gain dread, which we'll come back to. They can endure, which means they can take one of the dice rolled against them and get rid of it. Or do the same for an ally, but they'll gain an ache. And they can go into a frenzy, which means they attack as if they were a blast weapon. So they can, like, attack an entire group of people at once. Um, but it's indiscriminate and you gain shame. Now this shame, ache and dread are the other big addition to this game, which is burdens. Um, so burdens in this game, there are three different types. And when you gain them, each has its own specific way of getting rid of it. So if you gain an ache for instance, by using Endure. To get rid of that ache, you need to indulge in a selfish vice. 
and they're kind of left a little bit open to interpretation like that but there, there, there is going to be some guidance in the book as to what actually is required to do that um, I also like that they spell out sad uh, as soon as I was messing around with all these words and as soon as it spelled out sad I knew I was on something um, and if you ever have three or more burdens so you might have three of the same you might have three aches or two aches and a dread when you have three or more you become exposed when you're exposed you can't use any more feats and your guard goes down to zero effectively um, so you are at risk so don't do it basically having three burdens is really bad um, and yeah that that's the other big difference from Into the Odd uh, and Electric Bastion and really those, those two little additions really in terms of the kind of nitty gritty um, basics of, of kind of combat in the game so we've got our stuff we've got our nightly feats but what's our special feat so we have twisted words so you can speak but choose two different meanings as different as you wish even total opposites choose which meaning each listener takes from the words so if i'm in a room with 20 people i can say something and i can say i want these 12 people to interpret what I'm saying as, I don't know, I fully support the king, 100%. And I want the eight people in this corner to interpret it as, I do not support the king. And you can you can kind of, some of the feats will cause a, um, some of the feats will cause like a burden or have some kind of requirement, but this one, you can just do that as often as you, as often as you like. So you can kind of mess with people, you can kind of, It'll be useful in like court situations. Um, yeah. And so let's let's jot that into the thing. Twisted words. I knew this was gonna cause me trouble. Twisted words, which is say something. I'm gonna write the truncated version, say something. Give it two meanings. And then, something that's a pretty new addition as well is the vow. So we have the vow of integrity, which means that we're gonna gain an ache whenever we have to defer to somebody unworthy of their position. Um, and one of the questions in the um, in the chat, uh, Constantino Pianist, um, said is is burden removal purely narrative it is but i i do want to have some real pretty clear guidance in there for the referee because i don't want it to just be checking a box you know sometimes like you'll get these some things in certain rpgs it feels like the players just end up like saying okay well obviously i do this thing because i need to because i need to tick this box i don't want it to be like that i think the idea is they should all require some sort of action or it should come with a little bit of a cost so it's, we, we mentioned um uh let's say ache so we talked about ache but let's let's write our vow in first so integrity which is gain ache when deferring to person unworthy of their position so we mentioned egg. Let's say we have to do this. Let's say our character decides um, that they have to kind of defer to someone to keep the peace, but we know that that person is unworthy of their position. So they end up with an ache. Now, indulge in a selfish vice. I think to do that enough to clear the burden, it has to cost you something. So it could be that if some obvious ones are kind of like going out and drinking a load of alcohol or going and having like a massive feast and like indulging in like gluttony and excess i think to do that it should carry it should leave some kind of like maybe social impact so like you've you've perhaps offended somebody in this area that you're doing it or you've left like a bit of a loose thread or a mess behind you um so there's going to be a bit of guidance in there uh in the odd apocrypha section at the back of the book there's going to be a bit of guidance on this situation and how to how to actually adjudicate it so I think that's basically it. So we mentioned age. Um, you can start as older knights. We'll, we'll come back to age, but for now we're going to say that we are a green knight. <laughs> Not that one. Uh, but we are green in the sense that we are in the green age of our lives, uh, which is 
any age up to where you feel like you're still kind of learning, still coming up to your prime. Um, mature is kind of the golden years. This is when you're in your prime. Um, however old you are, look in the mirror. That's the age. Um, mature is like you're, 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 at, you're at your peak. And old is, well, we all know where this is going. Old is when you start to go past the peak. Um, and your character will age as, as the game goes on. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little, a little bit more later on. Of note here, um, it might just be because I'm like in my late 30s. But I, I thought it was funny that I, I suggested in this game that characters are in their peak at this kind of mature age. Whereas... Two games that I really dipped into this year are Pendragon and Traveller, Classic Traveller. And I think in Classic Traveller, I think you start to decline after 34 years old. And in Pendragon, I think you start to decline after 35. So this game is just one big um, knee-jerk reaction <laughs> to that horrifying uh, revelation that the, your mid-30s is apparently your, your absolute peak. Um, oh, we, we didn't put in here that we are the Riddle Knights. Uh, we don't know our ultimate fate. We we could put our crest on here. So I I had too much fun making all these crests. You can you can use these um, if you want, or you can pick one from a different knight. Every knight has their own on their page. Um, we need a name. There are some names at the bottom here. So Ruan Ruan feels pretty good. So Ruan the Riddle Knight, their ultimate fate. Who knows. Um, now let's let's do one more because I, I want to get on to actually um, actually running the game. We're going to do like a kind of not not quite a solo game in the traditional sense, but we're going to do like a little bit of a a run through the mechanics as if we are playing it for real. So let's go back to back to the start. So three ability scores. We have twelve for vigor, ten for wit. And 15 for Grace. So again, th these kind of map onto Strength, Dexterity and Charisma from um, from Electric Bastion Land, um, but not quite. It's a little bit different. I wanted them to project a little bit more kind of personality almost, because I do quite like it when you get that... When, when you're all ability scores, I think part of it is about getting a mechanically interesting character but I think a huge part of it for me is also getting a sense of who that character is um you know the, the classic example is when you roll a character with a really high or really low charisma it gives you something um something to kind of work with on there um I can see loads of questions coming in by the way I will get to them I'm gonna I'm gonna roll the rest of this night up and then we'll uh we'll get to those questions two guard again zero glory we're green. Our rank is petty. I didn't do that up here either, did I? So our rank is petty, which is tied to our glory. Um, and now what kind of knight are we? So we'll take this as a one and a seven. So one and seven gives us the willow knights. Here we go. The giants fought the storm, falling, all broken bones. The youth thrown about arose in the calm. Um, so let's... The Willow Knight. So the concept in this one is kind of like the Young Knight. Um, let's, get, let's get their name now. Uh, Talon. Um... In fact, I'll answer this now because somebody asked in the chat. Um, let me make sure I give credit here. Um, uh, Cryfex said, are the crests necessarily connected to the knight on the same page? This is one of those questions where no matter what I say, it's up to you. Um, they they are, I, I chose ones that would would fit okay if you wanted to. Some of them fit like quite obviously. Um, but you can still just use it as a general bank of like crests. So if you meet another knight as an NPC, you can just flick to one of these pages and take that crest if you just need a crest all of a sudden. Um, so the Willow Knight. We have an old sword. Uh, 
which is a d8 hefty weapon in fact the twisted bow should be a long weapon let's write that in there so hefty weapon it just means that you you can't really wield two hefty items at once uh, we have a light shield which gives armor one armor works exactly the same as in electric bastion land and into the odd um, and this does not count as armor for our vengeful bend, which is our um, feet. So we'll we'll remember that. Uh, we have a youthful energy. Use once to treat a mortal wound as a normal wound. So property, yeah, it, it can be kind of metaphysical things. Uh, so you can, if you take a mortal wound, which is the same as critical damage in Into the Yard and Electric Bastion Land, essentially it's a wound that means you will die if you're left untended and you're basically out of the fight. Um, the Willow Knight can say, well, I'm not going to take the, the mortal wound, but my, my youthful energy has died, which is a nice little character um, <laughs> character moment to go through. And we have a cautious steed. Um, as well as this, it's a little bit like the other games. You do have like a standard pack of stuff that all the knights get. So they all get like a dagger, rope, camping stuff and so on. Um, they have the same knightly feats, but we are going to get a new special feat. A uh, ventral bend. So you can use this immediately after you are attacked while unarmored. And you are not wounded as a result. So what that means is, if you take damage, the first damage that you take comes off your guard... And if you've run out of guard, the remaining damage comes off your vigor, which is how it worked with HP and strength in the other games. Um, if you just take guard damage, then that's when this activates, essentially. So you haven't been wounded. Uh, so if, you, if someone attacks you and you don't take any lasting damage from it, your next attack against them gets extra, um, a little bonus. So let's summarize that. There we go. And our vow is doubt. So you're going to gain dread when you have to confront somebody seeing it to you. And I wanted these because um, one of the cool things that I think what kind of drew me to the, well, one of many things that drew me to the idea of doing a kind of knights in a kind of semi-feudal system uh world is i like that there's so much like rigid structure to to what we imagine the feudal system was now i know that there are a lot of myths around what the feudal system was and and to what degree it really existed in the way that we think of it today but i this game is about this isn't a game of history this is a game of myth so we're we're, we're running with the myths rather than the history and the vow is just one of those little things. I, I like anything like this where it kind of really constricts how the character can act. Um, and rather than saying, like, you can't do this, it's it's just giving you that little, um, that little bit of friction where you might think twice when doing this. Um, we're also going to get some memories of home from this character, which is just a little bit of flavor, really. Um, one and six... So we remember a riverside and we remember a flood. So that paints a pretty clear picture of what our home was like. Um, I should also say these seers down here, um, they're not really used explicitly in at character creation, but the general idea is that this is the seer perhaps that knighted you. So here we have the carved seer. And seers have gotten a lot weirder in the last edition. Um, yeah, I'll talk more about Sears another time perhaps, but I'm, I'm really happy with the way that they're going. So I think that's that's our two characters created. Um, the one thing I didn't talk about is the oath. And we'll come back to this, because what we're going to do now is we're going to run through um, a little bit of a... But let me switch to this, um, just because I, I forgot to get something ready. Um, but what we're going to do is 
I'm going to bring up a um, bear with me we're going to bring up a map okay there we go we've got it um, I'm going to bring up a map because what we're going to do is we're going to like I said before, we're going to just kind of like run through a a brief kind of like almost like example of play really to see how this game actually works when you actually when you actually start playing it. So let's get my view back up. So we have this, um, which is a realm map that I made this week. It's not the one that I made last week because um, I've also been tinkering around with the ones I've been doing have mainly been at like landlocked, but I really like the idea of having like a kind of island realm. So this one's a little bit different. This was made using hex kit. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to run through this as a kind of like example of play. And we're going to say, let's say that our character, uh, our characters rather, our two knights, Let's say we have arrived in the realm. Let's say we have arrived on a boat and we have arrived in this hex here. So we'll, we'll, we'll zoom straight in because we're going to be kind of focusing in on one sort of area of the realm. Um, this forest hex here, we're going to say that we are here. Now, as I said, what are we doing here? We are fulfilling our oath. And our oath has three parts. As a knight, we are sworn to protect the weak, who are the vassals who toil and rely on our sword. We swore to seek the myths, which are stories that must be manifested into reality. And we swore to honour the seers, those who glimpse our past and future. So, at the end of every season which we'll come back to, but a season is what it sounds like. It's it's one of the three seasons of the year in this world. Um, at the end of the season, you're going to decide, each individual player is going to decide how many of these three um, parts of the oath have you fulfilled. And it's entirely down to you as the player. The referee can talk about it with you and you can talk about it with the rest of the group, but ultimately you will decide and you will say, you know what, I think I have protected the weak. I think I have sought out myths, but I don't know if I've honoured the seers because I, did, I didn't I did do what one of the seers asked me to do. So in that case, you would gain two glory. And that is where this uh, glory, wherever it's gone, this glory table comes in. Because as you ascend through the ranks of glory, you will gain like a new, a nice little title, but also things like being worthy of leading a warband or being worthy of a place in court or being worthy of commanding an army of ruling a holding perhaps ruling the seat of power which is the entire realm and eventually becoming worthy of the city quest which is kind of the end game goal of any knight uh, and it's it's impossible no, no knight can ever complete the city quest or maybe they can um so that's what we're trying to do so as a new knight here, we could just go wandering around hoping we bump into some myths. But um, one of the best ways to find out about myths is to go and talk to someone who lives here. Um, because they will be able to tell you what to expect from these myths. And they will be able to maybe help you help you avoid some of the more dangerous elements of the myths. Um, so if we are here, a day is split into three phases. There is morning, there is afternoon, and there is night. And traveling without a route is called hiking. And if you're traveling without a route or traveling on foot, um, you're just kind of hiking through. It's going to take you an entire phase of the day to move just one hex. Because like we discussed last week, a hex is a hex league. It's, it's quite a huge area. It's, it's sort of the area that can be viewed from on top of a hill. Or a, or a tall fort. 
So what we might want to do is we might want to head towards this area over here, which is what's called a Shire Hex. So these are all wild hexes. This is a Shire Hex, which is going to have people in it, essentially. And we can go and talk to some of these locals, find out what's going on. We can say that we're protecting the weak because we're going out to these vassals and we're going to go and see if they need any help. And perhaps we'll even find out where, um, where the nearest seer is. The seers tend to live in the holdings, which are these bigger, anything that's labelled with a with a letter on this map um, but, but we're a fair distance away from them so we're going to head to this shire first um, so when you travel you don't just move um, in fact I should have said we said that hiking moves one hex if we can actually get a route um, then we can move two hexes at once but to get a route you're going to have to actually spend a task to get that route and a task is, if you think about a turn in combat being like you can move and do an action, a task is kind of that on the the bigger scale of traveling across the hex map. So a, a task is something you can do as you are traveling across the realm. So we can move and do a task at the same time. Some typical tasks are things like setting up camp um, because you don't want to be traveling at night, um, plotting a route, um, it typically involves finding a guide or a vantage point. Um, and you, you can't rely on this route forever. It's just kind of a temporary thing. So maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll lead with a task. Now, we're going to do a bit of a, a simplified version of this because normally you'd be doing this as a conversation with the referee and the other players. So we're going to do a bit of a dry mechanical version of it. So we could say, we're going to try and find a route towards this Shire Hex, which we know to be here. Um, and to do that, we're going to just scour around this forest and we're going to, well, do we want to split up? We have to kind of say what we're doing. And I think since there's no guide around here, um, perhaps we want to just like try and find a vantage point. So we're going to try and find somewhere we can see just to see if there's like a river we can follow or a trail or anything like that. Now, typically when you're out doing things like this in the wild, there is going to be an element of risk to it. Um, there is a procedure in here that helps the referee decide how you adjudicate that risk but we're just going to cut to the chase and we're going to say you know what we're going to say this is a risky area so we're going to need to make a save so we can choose which of our knights is taking the lead on this task and they're going to have to make a save which is rolling equal or under to your ability score um, I think trying to find a route is kind of relying on your wit because wit kind of, wit kind of covers sensory challenges it's also like quick thinking and like awareness of your surroundings so i think wit is kind of what we're looking at here so out of our two knights i think our riddle knight had much better wit score so they're going to roll a save so we need to get uh, 13 or less we fail now, that's good because failing is more interesting than succeeding when it comes to the rules because it says here, even if you fail the save, the task might still be achievable, but now it faces an obstacle or additional cost. Uh, consider using complication prompts. Yeah, they're there at the bottom of each page. Or give them a burden. Um, while the cause and consequence of the failure can be personal, they can also represent the whims of nature, bad weather, shifting landscapes. So you know what? We're going to say... As the referee, perhaps I might go to a prompt. So we're going to pick to a random spread. Let's say this one. And we're going to look down here for where's complication. Uh, descent needed. So we're going to say that we have found a trail that would allow us to move quite quickly all the way up to this lighter patch of forest. But to get there, you kind of have to scale down this sheer cliff and it's going to be hard work. So if we decide to do that, uh, maybe they're both going to take an ache. And I think they decide, you know what, we really want to get going. Uh, we're going to do that. So our knights decide they will take the ache. So we'll give each of them one ache. It's fine. We, we can indulge in a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of our vices when we get to this uh, Shire. Um, but now we have a route. So rather than just moving one hex, we can move two. So they're going to go dunk dunk. And we are now here. 
Um, we've marched through all this kind of dry uh, moorland and we eventually get through to this kind of lighter forested area as we move into the afternoon. Now, whenever you end a phase of movement in a wild hex, you need to make a very creatively named... Can you imagine what this roll is called? It's called the wild hex roll, which is here. It's uh, it'll look familiar if you've seen like look rolls from any of the other uh, games, um, and essentially it's kind of like your reaction table. And for the most part, rolling a four, or four, five, or six means you're going to be all clear, but it will punish you for traveling at winter and traveling at night. But we're not. We're going to say it's. We'll say it's uh, spring. And uh, it's it's morning, so that's not going to affect us. If, if we can get a four plus, it's all clear. If we can get two or three, we'll encounter an omen from the nearest myth. If we can roll a one, we'll get an omen from a random myth. So let's see what we actually get. One. So a one means we're going to encounter an omen from a random myth in this um, in this realm. And if we roll a die. We can see we're going to encounter myth number six, which on this map is actually all the way down here. Um, and for the purposes of keeping things simple, I'm using myths one to six from the start of the book. Um, but there will be 72 of these myths to choose from for your realm. So even though we're all the way up here, occasionally you will encounter omens of more distant myths, but you will much more likely encounter uh, omens from the nearest myth to you in your area. So yeah, number six. So what's myth number six? Uh, it's the goblin, this guy. On toes it crept just out of sight, the petty hoarder full of spite. Their cleverness the goblin, lord of all lost things. Um, so again, this would be described much more like an actual RPG rather than the very mechanical dry thing we're doing now. Uh, so we would encounter, on our way, a weeping huntsman, uh, cursing everyone, looking for his lost bloodhound who tended to him during injury. So you're going to get lots of these situations where it's like, well, now do we stick around and help this guy? Because we did pledge to protect the weak. This guy seems pretty weak. Um, but whatever we decide to do, we're always going to encounter these omens in order. So next time we get an omen from the goblin, it will be this thing. Next time after that it will be number three and so on until we get to number six which is normally quite kind of climactic so let's pretend that they that they resolve this situation we don't especially need to to go into detail but it is now the afternoon and our nights are here so because we're just one hex away from the shire we don't need to worry about finding a route um so we'll just travel there So when you end your movement in um, in a non-wild hex, so typically a shire hex or a holding, uh, you don't need to make a wild hex roll, so there's no there's no chance of an encounter. And going here, we can kind of like, um, we can spend a little bit of time. We don't need to worry about setting up camp. It's assumed that you're going to get hospitality. Again, you would role play all this out. Um, but yeah, that's it's, it's kind of a little bit of a safe haven. But as you can see, they are kind of spread quite far apart. So from here, if we want to find anyone actually important, we kind of want to be getting to one of these holdings, either A, which is the seat of power, or C, which is another holding. Um, from the referee's point of view, you might think, well, how do I improvise what's in this holding? And again, that's, sorry, what's in this Shire Hex, not what's in this holding. Well, you can just go to your, uh, your prompts again. So we can see you've got a landscape, oppressive woods. The building is a ruined watchtower. The place name is Byfield. So maybe this is a little village built around a ruined watchtower and the woods are kind of growing in over this. Um, the theme is healing. So maybe there's, maybe they need healing. Maybe there's someone there who's able to offer healing, which is a useful person to have. Um, you got people, you got characteristics. And again, you don't need to choose all the same ones from the same spread, you can mix it up. You could take the building from this one. You could take the theme from this one. So the theme here is food. You could take food and healing. 
it's it's more just little sparks to kind of get the ball rolling and again there will be like 72 of these so we're at this holding we're going to camp out for the night no we're not going to camp out we're just going to enjoy some nice hospitality and um there's no need to make any rolls we get um, a night's rest in a bed now if we go back to the travel rules uh where is it each morning if you did not have at least one phase of rest yesterday we're going to gain an ache so if we'd had to carry on marching through the night um a couple of things could have gone wrong marching through the night is risky because you risk getting dread for marching through the night and if we hadn't slept we'd get an ache so it's easy to see how these burdens can kind of rack up and you can end up in a bit of a difficult situation um so we'll say that we, we didn't try and indulge in a selfish vice in this little town um we'll say that they decided we're gonna we're gonna hang on to that for now so our next day let's try and get across to here so i think looking for a route as our task here um i think because we've presumably made some good contacts here in this shire i think someone here would know a good route so i don't think we need to make a roll because one of the principles of this game is if there's no risk then you don't need to roll um you know there's a there's a little procedure here for taking action that you go through and one of the phases is just if there's no risk then don't make a roll um, there might still be a cost, but I think we've made a good, we've made some good contacts in this town. Someone will know the route, so we find a route that will get us down to this, through this bog and into these kind of hilly area. So we're going to travel dun, dun, through to here, and then I think we don't want to, because of this ache, we're, we're going to take our time marching over here. So instead, in the afternoon, no, we need to roll our wild hex roll. So at the end of the morning, we roll our wild hex roll. Two means we encounter an omen from the nearest myth. So we are here. It's where you end your turn. What is the nearest myth? So myth number one is pretty close. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, sorry. You know, what? I think it's between one and two. Um, for the sake of simplicity, I think we'll say number one. I could count it out, but it doesn't make for especially gripping viewing. So if one was our nearest uh, myth, we will encounter the next omen from, oh no, it's the plague. Um, a wandering old coot proclaims their dreams where foul air was choking people in their sleep. He pleads for help in spreading the word. Um, so again, we would role play that out. We would determine what we decide to do there. And all this is going to come back to be in our memory when we decide whether or not we fulfilled our oath. But that, that's not too bad of an omen to get. They do tend to start off quite nice and gentle. Um, so we've ended our morning here. Now it's afternoon. So at the end of this phase, it's going to be uh, night. So we would like to make sure we set up camp. Um, so when we're traveling here, we'll probably want to spend our task setting up camp which again might come with a save, uh, which if we fail it, it might grant a burden or it might cause some other kind of cost or it might put complication between us and the camping. And that's kind of the basics of traveling. I'm not gonna like march us all the way across the map, but that's the general kind of procedure for how traveling works in this game. Um, combat is very similar to Into the Ard and Electric Bastion Land in many ways. Um, so I'm not gonna go too far into that. Um, what we will do now is we will pretend that we've had a bit of a session. And let's say um, we know that guard, guard is recovered at the end of a fight. So at the end of a session, our guard is going to be full. But let's say that Ruan has taken... Um, let's say they've taken a little bit of vigor damage. Let's say they're down to two out of six vigor. Um, and let's say we've taken... Let's say we're taking another ache. Um, and then let's say that um, Talon, let's say that they also managed to get a shame from something they did. Um, and let's say, 
yeah, let's say they took a little bit of bigger damage as well. Let's say they just took two points of bigger damage. So at the end of a session, you might look like this. Now, what you could do is next session, you could say, well, we're just going to carry on from where we finished. And there's actually a little bit of guidance here. So at the end of a session, you can say how much time is going to pass before next week's game. You could have minimal, minimal time where you just carry on. Um, but this game is really intended to take place over a longer time. So I'd really encourage groups to sort of take a, take a longer view on it and say at the very least, like maybe weeks has passed. So we're going to move on to the next significant event in the season. So as soon as we're in spring, um, our first session might have taken place during the Feast of the Stars. Um, but then we might be moving into the toil, which is kind of the fasting period of this world. Um, but you can say, well, if months are going to pass, we can move on to the next season. And moving on to the next season is good because you get to restore all of your abilities. So all of your lost vigor. Um, in general, that in, in, in other games, like you can restore your lost strength with like some significant period of rest. But here it has to be like a season. Uh, so that vigor score, if you want to get that back, you have to say, well, we're going to find a place to hunker down for the season. Um, and let's say that we decided we're going to move so that the next game will take place in the harvest season because there's only three seasons in this world. Um, so we would restore our vigor. And then we would each choose one from here. So we could go on a little pilgrimage, which would allow us to learn about an unknown part of the realm and relieve a shame. Um, courtesy, so we could spend the time schmoozing with, uh, with high up people to establish a new contact or earn a favor and relieve ache. Or we could uh, dedicate ourselves to service to make a small improvement to the realm and relieve our dread. Now, obviously you are gonna be nudged into a certain direction based on what burdens you have. So, um, being as Ruan um, has all this ache, we might say that they want to spend the focus on courtesy to establish a new contact or earn a favor. So they relieve their ache, whatever they do. But between sessions, we might also say, well, perhaps Ruan was in the seat of power and they've established a new contact there. So in the next session, the referee will decide who that contact is and sort of present them as a new useful contact that Ruin has kind of made a bit of um, a bit of progress with between the seasons. And then Talon, um, I think Talon is going to try and get rid of this shame. They're going to do the, the pilgrimage option. Um, so learn about an unknown part of the realm. So Talon, perhaps they're going to go all the way out on a pilgrimage to maybe this distant place here. So even though we've been moving around up this sort of corner of the map, uh, between the seasons, uh, Talon has ridden out to here on a pilgrimage um, and we'll get a little bit of information about what this place is and who's there. And it could it could be a remote place. We could say, I want to know what's on this little island here. And the referee will um, will give that information. So that's, um, that's what happens between seasons. Let's say we've played a few more sessions and you know we've taken some more damage and things like that but let's say we're actually going to look at moving into a new age so we said that our life has three ages we're young knights in fact wait 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 hold this <laughs> we forgot what else you do at the end of a season uh, at the end of a season is when you gain glory so i mentioned these three parts of our oath so Uh, Ruan. Ruan is going to look at these. They're going to say, did I protect the weak? Did I seek the myths? And did I honor the seers? Um, let's say that Ruan has said, you know what? I've been pretty good. I've done all three. I'm taking the three glory. Uh, Talon. Now Talon might have done something. So because Talon has this shame, I'm feeling like Talon has perhaps done something not fantastic. So maybe they're going to say, you know what? I don't feel like I did protect the weak successfully um but i did seek the myths and honor the seers so we're going to give me two glory and it's 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 a bit unusual to have this kind of like self-assessment thing in there but it's something i'm keen to to explore so that is something you also do at the end of a season so that's a kind of gentle nudge 
for characters to, uh, to to move to different seasons. So at Three Glory, um, our, uh, our Riddle Knight is now a Knight Militant, which means they are deemed worthy of leading a warband, which is like a detachment detachment style kind of group of fighters. So um, perhaps in the court of the Seat of Power, um, our Riddle Knight will now be called up to actually lead a group in combat. Um, and again, it, it notes here, just because you're worthy of this thing doesn't mean you suddenly get it. So it's not like the Riddle Knight suddenly has a warband behind them, uh, but it just means that you're kind of, it, it's it's like a social thing. So you're kind of like now deemed worthy of that position. And you, you might be, you might fall into a position that you're not worthy of, and that can bring problems of its own. So let's say we played a couple more sessions and like I said, we wanted to move to the next age. So if we did this, our knights would move from being young to being mature. And I guess like a new generation of young knights would crop up. And all, all of the mature knights who we already know would move to old and all of the old knights, well, we'll, we'll get back to them. But um, when you move to a different age, you remove all burdens, you restore all abilities and you choose one of these. So let's get rid of our burdens because, you know, an age is like at a very rough level. We're probably talking like 20 years, but it, it's like a generation, really. Um, so we could choose legacy to establish a successor. So perhaps we get like a squire. That'd be pretty cool. So you know what? I think it'd be a cool thing to do that if Talon, who was our Willow Knight, who was our young, youthful knight, perhaps they have taken on a squire who they're going to train up as their successor. And there's, there's rules in there for generating squires, but we won't go down that. Um, duty, we can make a significant improvement to the realm. Or mastery, you can learn a feat from a senior knight you have proven yourself to. So perhaps Talon, um, feeling a sense of duty. Perhaps they're still feeling a little bit of shame over feeling like they hadn't properly protected um, the, the weak. Perhaps their duty is they're going to fortify this town perhaps this is where they kind of ran into trouble um they're gonna dedicate themselves to fortifying this town and perhaps this actually becomes a holding and it becomes more of a fortress um if you have unresolved situations you can see what's happening with them um which is just a handy little table to have um but the other thing that happens when you move into your new age is when you become mature you basically re-roll all your ability scores and keep them if they are higher um, when you become old, the opposite happens. You roll them again and keep them if they're lower. And if you're already old and you move into a new season, you lose D D12 Vigor. And obviously when you reach zero Vigor, that's it for that character. They are... Well, I guess if, if you make it to that point and you die, then at least you died of old age, which is a pretty good pretty good um, innings for this kind of character. So we'll, we'll, we'll do those again. So... Our mature version of Ruin, because this can create some interesting little moments. So his Vigor is now 11, because that's higher than 6. So Wit, if it's higher than 13, no, Wit stays the same. Grace is 11. 14, so Ruin has picked up some new social graces. They've strengthened their body up a little bit. They're in their prime. Um, Talon, what does the mature version of Talon look like? So Talon's already got pretty good scores, so they, they might actually not change at all in that sense. Yeah, so five for Vigor, that won't change. Wit of 15. They've, they, they, their youthful, innocent uh, obliviousness has kind of gone and they are now much more aware of how the world works. And Grace 12 is going to stay the same. So they're going to get... You can get these weird situations where you roll a character with like Vigor 2 when they're green and then you suddenly get them up to like Vigor 18. Um, it can happen and I think I like those kind of situations because they force you to get a bit creative and work out, well, what does that mean that that's happened? Um, how could this possibly have happened? Um, because i i i have had systems before where it's a bit more incremental and you're just going up a little bit but this is an age this is like 20 years and a lot can change in 20 years it could be that this this green young knight um as they reach maturity um 
they kind of they they flourish or they have learned something at the hands of a of a mentor that really kind of changes changes the character um so that is kind of the basics of how the game sort of works as a whole we've got our traveling around the realm um i didn't go into the combat because if you play it into the auto electric bastion and it's similar there are some differences um there are some differences in the way that like weapons and armor work slightly but it's all kind of the same as what you'd expect um certainly from electric bastion land it's it's, it's closest to that one in terms of how the the actual nitty-gritty of combat works um i'm just going to look back over the questions because i did see there were a couple in there um yeah so we spoke about burdens being narrative um so w when i spoke about guidance at the back of the book there's this section called Odpocrypha, which is um, each page is a example of play and then a kind of commentary on that example of play, talking about what the what the GM and the players have done and why they've made the decisions the way they have and perhaps what they could have done differently. And there's going to be a lot of these because I think this is an interesting way of looking at some stuff that like games don't often talk about, like getting stuck of just like when you when you don't know what to do next or getting rules wrong, uh, and relieving burdens is one that I haven't written yet, but it is on the list. I'm going to have some guidance here for what does it actually look like to relieve a burden and what's the kind of intent behind that rule. Uh, yeah, Cryfex when I was, when I was talking about having the burden should kind of have a cost. Uh, sleeping with someone's wife could be a good example. Absolutely. Um, that's sure, sure to create more problems than it solves, perhaps. Um, Sam, Sam Dobler says ship rules. Um, not really, not yet. I mean, there are, the, the, there's like a stats for ships. Uh, the, the good thing about this kind of, this kind of era is that I think ships when I think about ships in a kind of early medieval Arthurian myth kind of era, ships are basically just like moving places to jump over and fight with swords. So I don't think it needs to have necessarily uh, lots of rules for um, like ship to ship. Like obviously there's no guns, um, but there, there, there are a few things on here. You've got like some stats for some different types of ship and how much they carry. And um, in terms of traveling, traveling by ship is the best way to do it because we said that hiking lets you move one hex and traveling on a horse along a known route is going to be two hexes, but traveling along a waterway or on the ocean is going to be three hexes. Um, so really getting a boat all the way from like here all the way around to this holding is probably like the best way of doing it but is it very knightly are you fulfilling your knightly oath of seeking the myths and protecting the weak if you just decide to coast around on a boat uh, all day i don't know that, that's for you to decide um yeah um I, th I think that's that's basically all of the um oh no so patrick benjamin asks uh can old age allow players to lose one from strength and add one to charisma or wit? Um, no, because the, it, the, the age is kind of abstract here a little bit because it's it's framed very much as a character kind of has a peak, which might not be realistic. You know, I, maybe we do get more get get wiser as we got older, but I think the kind of the general arc of a character here. Is very much like the arc of the seasons. I, I I felt so, like pretentious when I noticed that I'd done this. But like, the fact that spring is the green season, and then you've got harvest, which is the gold season when everything's great and you're bringing in the harvest, and then winter is the grey season, which is kind of just the the crap bit of the year that you just need to get through. Um, the three ages of a person are kind of the same. Um, it you can see it as like younger and then middle aged and then elderly. But it's really more to do with just like reaching your peak. And when you're in the mature phase of your life, that is when you're kind of at your peak. So I did I did think about whether the score should go down as you get older. But 
I, I, I didn't want to have the chance for you to just keep on getting better. When, when you get basically older people are going to be at, at best, they're going to be just as good as they were in their peak. They're not going to um, get better in terms of raw ability scores, but you will have had more opportunity to learn feats. Uh, you'll have built, you'll have had more glory. So you'll have more social power. Um, you'll have more allies and you'll have perhaps a bigger kind of social network around you. So there are still advantages to being to being an old geezer in this world. Um, so yeah, I, I won't go into it now, but you have also got some rules in here for running a domain. Because um, I, everyone talks about domain play and I know some people who do play it, but I feel like it's often kind of pitched as this kind of like... For, for me, it's often felt like it's, if it's in a game... It's like, oh, well, that's cool, but I probably won't ever get to that. Whereas I wanted it here to be something that could... Um, something that you could you could even start the game there. Um, you could go straight into the domain play because... Well, maybe, maybe I need to do a different video on the domain level play, but it's not about counting tons of grain and so on. It's, it's more about just having a kind of... Some extra problems that come with ruling a domain. Um... And yeah, that's it. So if you haven't already checked it out, there was a new version went up live today uh, with lots of little changes in it. Um, the game is called Mythic Bastion Land. If you want to stay really up to date with it, you should uh, go to substack.com forward slash Bastion Land and, um, and uh, sign up to the newsletter there. Uh, you can find all these links at bastionland.com, including a link to the playtest version of Mythic, <laughs> Mythic Bastion Land, which is free. Um, and will eventually be an actual book and as always if you want to support this stream and everything that I do you can go to patreon.com forward slash bastionland uh, and if you want to talk about anything to do with bastionland including the development of mythic bastionland there is a discord server that has a channel just for that and again go to bastionland.com all the links are in the sidebar um, cryfx asked a very good question uh, which is um, with the older characters being the ones that have the highest glory, wouldn't it make it that the old characters are the ones most likely to be pursuing the city? Well, the city quest is an interesting conundrum, and it is one that I am hopefully going to be writing about relatively soon. Um, but you are kind of onto something, yes. Um, but that that whole area is quite quite vague at the minute. But I've got some ideas around that. Um, so as always, thanks for watching. Um, I hope to see you in the Discord server. And um, until next time, it's goodbye for now.